Welcome everyone to City Lions Book Club Live. So I'm really excited. As a matter of fact, you know, you can maybe start putting me into stalker status because this is her second book club pick from Uzma Jalaluddin. So this is <laughs> Anacon carries on and I'm holding it like this so that the glare, you can still see the title there. Uh, my lights are blinding. Uzma, it's so, I'm um, so happy to have you back. You give me the books that I need, especially during a pandemic. Let me tell you, I need some joy. I need some love. I need some romance. I love that you've done that uh, with this book. So first of all, how's it been? How are you? You know, it's just, I'm, I think it's survival. We're all in survival mode, but thank you so much, Tracy. I'm, I'm so happy to be here and to talk about love and joy and, you know, just happy people of color falling in love and talking about food. And I, I really feel like this is the book that uh, hopefully will help people get through things a little bit. <laughs> Absolutely. It's what we need. There's a lot of trauma. There's a lot of bad news. So it, it's yeah. nice to have the joy. Now, um, in the beginning of the, uh, the, the book, at the beginning of the story, Hannah is corresponding with Aiden uh, anonymously. And she doesn't reveal her name in the podcast. And she wants to keep everything on the down low. And, and, and he's using a pseudonym. Um, so do you find that easier in general for people to be themselves and to talk this way? Or like, what are the positives and negatives of having that kind of starting a relationship like that? Yeah, I think so many people like, like online dating has become a phenomenon for, for so long. And like, basically everyone I know who's single is dating online. Like that's, that's the way that you meet people these days. And I just thought like for Aiden and Hannah, they're, they're not specifically online dating. They're not like an app on an app or anything like that. They're, they just become like friends through a podcast. Um, and I think there's something about the anonymity. Like I was telling you, Tracy, I'm a high school teacher. And right now I'm teaching online, like all of the schools in Ontario are on online right now. Uh, and even though I know my students, the anonymity of that, like them, they're just little, little avatars and with their name underneath it. And I think that gives them so much more freedom to like, you know, they're, they'll jump in and they'll feel more comfortable to say, you know, to, to discuss certain things or to express their opinion in a certain way. Um, it's almost, it's that whole like phenomenon of having a different persona when you're online uh, yeah. versus when you are face to face. And, and the, the additional layer on Aiden and Hannah is Hannah is a visible Muslim woman. Uh, she wears a hijab, you know, she's, she's a young Muslim woman who lives in Toronto. And I feel like the anonymity of that just gives her, whether it's through her texting with, uh, with Aiden, who in the book is Stanley P, um, or it's through, you know, producing her anonymous podcast, it just gives her a, an extra layer of just like safety and comfort. No one's going to come after her because they don't really know who she is. And so she can really be honest about her authentic self. It's interesting because there's so much to be said about being a racialized person and not having to lead with that, you know, uh, or, or, you know, wearing your religion or wearing your race and having that be the thing that people see first. When you have that block up, it's in incredible the safety it gives you um, and the spaces that you can get into. Very interesting. I don't know what's going to happen when everyone has to get back to work in the office because I think that I it's kind of been nice in a way to have that. I agree. Um, so Hannah, I love, uh, you write a very good protagonist. So she's stuck between so many important forces, her family's business, her dream of being a radio host, her father's fledgling health, of course. How are Hannah's experiences sort of indicative of the wider issues second generation Canadian immigrants face? such a good question. I was really trying to tap into a particular moment in a young person's life. And I was trying to be very, you know, very cognizant of the the, the, the intersection, in, intersectional identity of Hannah and how that plays out in real time at this particular age. In, in a weird way, I see um, Hannah Han carries on as almost like a uh, you know, it, like we, we call it a buildings room on, like it's a coming of age story. Usually those stories are set around age 12, but I feel like nowadays, um, you know, everything up until you're done school, whenever you decide to finish school, is sort of set. You know, you just go to school every day, do your schoolwork. Uh, maybe you'll get a job here and there, but Hannah is at the end of that journey. So she's 24 years old when the book starts and she's kind of like, okay, I did all the things I was supposed to do. Now what? And then the, complica the complicated um, layer to that is that she is, as you said, she's a child of immigrants. So she doesn't have that social safety net that just being part of a society for generations provides. So her parents are struggling entrepreneurs. Her mother has this, this restaurant that was doing well, but now it's not. Her father, as you said, is, is, is sick and can't, can no longer work. He was involved in a, in a terrible car accident. And so I just wanted to 
put the reader into this person's shoes. Like, what is it like to not, to just fly without a net, to just to be, uh, and Hannah, I think is very brave in a lot of ways. She's, she's willing to jump in and take a lot of chances on a lot of the opportunities that come her way. But she does, if she fails, um, there is no one to catch her. And I think that's the experience of the real life experience of so many children of immigrants. There is no one to catch us if we fall. The stakes are high and uh, we have no networking. <laughs> There's yeah. no one to help. Like where's the rich, where's my rich uncle or, or auntie? Like who, no one is like connected in my family. So, so true. It's like, I'm we gotta do it for ourselves. <laughs> yeah, for that's right. Younger people coming up because we don't have any of that. Um, yeah. Part of her experience is, uh, as well, and I feel that you and I can both relate to this, is just about the, the microaggressions. She's very good, though, at having them fall right off her back. Mm -hmm. um, is there a bit of, of, of you and Hannah, or would, would you react differently to the kinds of microaggressions that she faces? Yeah, you know, I, so my first novel, I shot last, uh, just to backtrack a little bit, was about this, uh, you know, it was a retelling of Pride and Prejudice. But the main kind of Mr. Darcy character has this very racist, very uh, overtly Islamophobic boss. And like, I felt like the 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 racism and the discrimination that he felt was almost a caricature. Like it was, I was almost like getting a lot of my rage out about that. And I was like, okay, my second book, I want to get real. I want to talk about the, the racism that I have personally experienced in the workplace and that I know that a lot of my friends who are racialized have also similarly experienced and oftentimes they're like you know I'm because I'm a rom-com writer uh, I, I'm a fan I, I I remember this line from Bridget Jones's diary this like you know I'm sure everyone who loves rom-coms know, knows what I'm talking about classic uh, rom-com book where she described like the attack of a frenemy as a little jellyfish sting and you don't even know that you've been stung until the jellyfish has gone away mm -hmm. and that's what it feels like when you're when you have these little microaggressive -aggress attacks in the workplace where you're like wait am I did, did that actually happen I don't am I being too sensitive um mm -hmm. okay you know what I'll just for the sake of workplace harmony, I have to stay here. This person is my colleague. This person is my boss. Let me just ignore it. And Hannah is in that position at work. She works, she interns at Radio Toronto, where her immediate supervisor, her boss, the person who literally will decide whether or not she gets a job, uh, her internship leads to employment, uh, is constantly undermining her and saying little comments like, oh, well, I know culturally you're not allowed to do this. Are your parents okay with you not having an arranged marriage? And she's kind of like, why are you making assumptions about me? You don't even know me. Um, and and Hannah ignores it for a really long time. And I, I know for me, I, I, I think every racialized person has experienced a certain level of ignorance in their, uh, you know, whether it's their social mm -hmm. life or their working life or whatever it is. And we carry these, these, these kind of like little traumas on our back, right? Um, but uh, I don't think, I think for when I was her age, I definitely would have ignored it. I think now that I'm older, I probably say something about it, but I know I have ignored and kind of laughed off jokes that were extremely inappropriate, like extremely yeah. insulting. When I think about it now, I'm like, what is, I can't believe that person did that. Um, I don't know if that's just a, a commentary on where we are as a society where our tolerance has has dropped. Um, yeah. But, uh, yeah, Hannah, I think is a bit more brave than I was at her age. Yeah, well, the, con the conversation also I've been having with a lot of people is about, you know, Gen Zers and to a lesser extent millennials, like, they are terrifyingly in touch with what they need to happen and with calling people out. Yeah. I give them a lot of props for that. And I mm -hmm. think that I, I have been like you just trying to survive. Like I'm trying to That's survive. It. So yep. I, I'm not going, there's no, there's no protocol for me to go anywhere anyways to report a microaggression. So I'm exactly. going to have to shrug it off and move on to get, to get to the next, uh, to get to the next level. But it's an interesting commentary on where we are now, because I do feel like the dial has been pushed in terms yep. of what people can say and what people can take. Um, and, and that's sort of, you know, an interesting place to be uh, here yeah. in polite Canada, right? <laughs> well, it's also about just the, the whole lack of social safety net that we were talking about earlier. When you're like, yes. I don't know how to navigate this space because A, I don't have any mentors to kind of guide me. And B, if I make a wrong mistake and I get fired, well, that's, that's not just my... Um, you know, livelihood on the line. I, I'm, I'm carrying the hopes of my parents, the hopes of my family behind me. So I, I think, I hope that young people have a little bit more support, maybe a little bit more mentorship. Like, you know, I'm sure Tracy, you do so much good work in mentorship. And um, I know for me, I, if anyone has any questions about writing or anything like that, I'm like, yeah, you're, especially if you're racialized, I'm, I'm very willing to have those conversations. So 
Yeah. We know what it's like. We've been there. <laughs> We've been there. So see, we're occupying those spaces and like putting a hand out and saying, you know, come along. So we're going to, we're changing. We're changing that whole trajectory right now as we live and breathe, which is amazing. Um, I loved that. Okay, actually, I'm going to stay in that same realm for a bit because at one point, um, Yusuf calls aid in a colonizer, which I think is very interesting because... <laughs> Often we think of colonizers as synonymous with white people, and that isn't the case with Aiden and uh, Junaid Shah. So were you being very intentional about sort of, um, you know, showing that the South Asian community is not a monolith and showing that these ideas of colonization, um, they can be adapted by anyone? Yeah, I love that you pointed that out. That that was like a little, you know, writing is a very lonely, lonely uh, thing. And I always say this, like, sometimes I just put little jokes in to amuse myself and then they make it to the <laughs> final copy. <laughs> but yeah, no, I, I mean, one of the things that I always try to do in all of my books is sort of layer the understanding of what it means. Like, I, I always want to write about diversity within diverse communities, right? So mm -hmm. we have our issues with socioeconomic status as well. Aiden mm -hmm. comes from a very wealthy family. He comes from privilege. His family, his family is not just you know upper middle class they're wealthy they're tycoons uh they are colonizers they are infringing on the golden crescent neighborhood where hannah hannah Khan takes place it's you know a fictional scarborough neighborhood and they are there to gentrify and yusuf calls it as it is he's like you're just here to take over you don't really care about the people who who exist even though they're both muslim uh yusuf is actually arab muslim and um and aiden of course is south asian but he calls him a colonizer because it's just it's it's so much more of a punch because you know most <laughs> south South Asians have been colonized on multiple levels, you know, like Brit the uh, British Raj was in India for 400 years. So to call him a colonizer is just like, I, I see you and you're exactly as bad as, you know, the people who treat mistreated us for centuries. Uh, I thought it was yeah. funny. <laughs> but it's I, also it was true. good. It was good. <laughs> Thank you. That would hurt. <laughs> yeah. like, Ow. Ow. Uh, you mentioned gentrification and I want to talk about that. It is a huge theme in the book. It's actually a huge theme in so many books I've read lately yes. and not just rom-coms, like right across the board, like there is a, a big gentrification theme happening. Um, True. And, and, and this whole idea of where do immigrants go or where do these populations go when they can no longer afford their original neighborhood? So I think about the neighborhood mm -hmm. that I grew up in. Uh, my childhood neighborhood was mostly Jewish and then Italian. Um, and now it's very Persian and Chinese. And I look, I'm always asking my mom and dad, like, well, where did they go? Like, where did they move to? Where did they go? And, and, and who are the people that are coming in? So what I liked about this book is this idea of what do we lose when the populations leave? Yeah, that's, and it, it feels like I was sort of having a conversation in the pages, even with myself, because I grew up in Scarborough and I grew up in like, uh, like East Scarborough, and now I live in Markham and, um, I, and, and I've seen the population change. And also, um, I don't know if you, you've noticed this, Tracy, but I feel like uh, something that's always really bothered me is that the reputation of an area in, in a city like Toronto or, you know, any major city, if you see a lot of brown people or a lot of black people or a lot of Asian people, for some reason, even if that um, area is not you know, uh, maybe it's socioeconomically uh, disparate, it has mm -hmm. a bad, tends to have a bad reputation. So I grew up mm -hmm. in Scarborough and everyone was like, oh, you live in Scarborough, it's really dangerous. How do you even walk outside at night? And I was like, this is my hood, what, what are you talking about? Auntie and uncle live next door. I know exactly who my neighbors are. Do you know who your neighbors are? But, it, and I realized it's about race. It's about the fact that, oh, there's a lot of brown and black people here and therefore it's dangerous. And it yes. bothers me so much. I can't explain it to you. And I was trying yeah. to un unpack that. Like, let's really see what these neighborhoods hoods are like like actually the golden crescent is more like gilmore girls with more brown people if you think about it and those yes. neighborhoods exist uh and yet they only get attention when white people notice them and it always bothered me you know even the schools that i went to were like oh that's a bad school like no it's not it's it's perfectly fine um these schools produce the same amount of university graduates as maybe maybe other schools and yet uh -huh. at the same time we do have to unpack the idea of um, what kind of systemic bias, what does that systemic bias then lead to? You know, Scarborough is notorious for carding. I'm going off topic here, but <laughs> you know, there's all, there's so many conversations to be had. And with Hannah Khan, even though it's a rom-com, I really wanted to, uh, you know, just make space to see uh, that the way that gentrification affects 
uh, immigrants it can be can be quite toxic. Um, and at the same time, the, sometimes the people doing the gentrifying are the people from within that community, and it comes back to socioeconomic status, which I think is just it's such an interesting. There's no there's no solution to this. It's, uh, maybe there is, but there's no like it, it's just a huge conversation that I wanted to start uh, with my book. I'll probably write about this forever. Yeah, it is like what I like about it is that it is layered though, because yeah. you know it being a you know minority for lack of a better word it's like you're put into a a, a box and a slot and it's it, no one's looking at the diversity within that slot you know That's so right. i i think it's amazing that a rom-com um you have a good way of of making sure that there is a lot of reality in there so nothing came out and slapped me across the face all of it was like yep that makes sense yep that makes <laughs> sense yep that makes sense you know so i love yeah. that Thank you. Um, when Hannah is attacked with her cousin and Aiden at the CN Tower, which is a really sad uh, situation, of course, she is pressured to discuss this uh, at her radio show. So everybody wants, they need to dissect this trauma. Like this is, right. when we see a young hijabi woman and she is um, attacked, that's obviously, we need to, we need to get into that. Um, and, and, and what I love is that, um, you know, she's, obviously thought, thought this was problematic. And um, she, you know, I think for me as well, because I'm having a moment here from 2020 and beyond, it's been a lot of digging deep into trauma. Yeah. And, you know, at some point I had to ask myself, oh, what's happening here? Like, is there, I, I almost need to stop talking about this for a while because I felt like I was being mined for my trauma and these stories were being, you know, sort of weaponized in ways I wasn't comfortable with. So I, like, I guess um, I'm wondering if you as a journalist, because you've also written a column uh, for like a newspaper column. Yes, I, I, yeah, I write a column for the Toronto Star. For I've the Star. been writing it since 2015, yeah, a long time. Do you ever find that the focus is, you know, give us the bad stuff, please? It's interesting. So I write for the life section of the Toronto Star, and it's it's uh, the focus is it, because it's in the life section, it's a lot lighter. It's sort of slice of life, and it's um, the focus is on parenting. Uh, and so as long as I stay in my lane, this is what I've noticed. As long as I stay in my lane and I share, you know, mostly positive, uplifting stories about myself and you know stories about my family, my kids. Um, that's fine. But the minute I've tried to delve into stories that are a little bit more political, that's when the haters come out. So uh, a couple mm -hmm. of times in, in the past, I've written, for instance, when Trump was, uh, you know, the president of the United States. And I, I talked about I was I'm going to the United States for the first time. I'm worried because I'm very visible. And mm -hmm. should I wear a hat on top of my hijab to kind of hide mm -hmm. that? And I, I can't even tell you how much hate mail I got. <laughs> uh, and anytime, and I, I remember once I, I'm an English teacher, I was talking about maybe we need to revisit the classics. Maybe we should be reading To Kill a Mockingbird. Um, uh, because mm -hmm. there's so many other books that really discuss race in a more interesting, nuanced way, and I got lots of hate for that. So oh, I, gosh. but I, I completely know what we're, what you what you're talking about, Tracy. I feel like uh, anytime there's a certain trauma that involves my community, uh, whether uh, the Muslims are the victims or they're the perpetrators, uh, mm -hmm. everything the response, the, the, every single Muslim, every single visible uh, observant Muslim feels as if we're we're on trial. And I'm so tired of having to justify my humanity to people over and over again. Um, we saw the you know the completely horrific uh, hate crime that just occurred on uh, on the weekend, uh, mm -hmm. where a young man mowed down for uh, four members of a family and only the nine year old son survived. Mm -hmm. And I, I was just I was trying to process that through tears of grief. And I was I was just thinking like, am I going to be asked to to talk about this even before I even know what I think about this? Uh, mm -hmm. And it's so and and that's to to, to a certain extent, um, Hannah is what that's what she's facing she she's the the target of a hate motivated attack thankfully nothing as serious as what happened to that poor family in london ontario um very minor in the grand scheme of things but even the minorness of it she feels like wait should i even make a big deal about this should i i was basically just verbally harassed and it was a, it was an attempted assault that didn't go anywhere um and yet as you said her feelings are expect she's expected to immediately process immediately 
uh, jump on the offensive immediately, be media savvy about it. Okay, this is how I'm going to talk about my feelings uh, and present it and kind of, you know, put it in bite-sized chunks for my my audience. Uh, and I wanted to talk about the weight of that, like just yeah. put readers in her head. It's a first person perspective so that we, we know what Hannah's thinking. Just put them in her head. What does that feel like? Yes. Absolutely. And you did that brilliantly, I thought, like really brilliantly, because some people, it's a bit of a double edged sword at the at, at some point, it's like, sure, I would love to be given a little bit of space to grieve and to mourn and to have this sort of recognition that something bad went down. On yep. the other hand, I do not want the burden of reporting that I don't want the, right. burden, the burden of talking about that, of analyzing that publicly. So I, I just feel like you you really handled it uh, beautifully. Uh, you mentioned Aisha at last, another book that we loved. Uh, your first novel has been published in the US, the UK, Australia, and India, excuse me, and was <laughs> optioned for film by uh, Amy Pascal and Sony Pictures. So any plans for an adaptation of this book yet? Uh, you know what? It's 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 been such an exciting and wild ride. They, they I mean they hired a fantastic screenwriter and they're basically you know trying to I'm I'm in what's known as the development process. Uh, so uh, I, I don't have anything exciting to to say except that it's still in development and they're they're looking for um, you know for for directors and I think they're thinking about cast and and all of that. The the script is fantastic. I I did have a chance to to to. Uh, to, to get to know about it some more. So that's really exciting. Um, and Amy Pascal is the producer behind the Spider-Man movies. So for me, when this happened as a debut novel, as they actually, uh, they actually, actually optioned the book a couple of years ago when, when Aisha at last first published, um, to me, it, it felt more like recognition that these stories matter, that there is an audience for these stories, there's an interest and a hunger for these stories. I, you know, I, I get a lot of uh, questions from people saying like, what did your community think when Aisha at last was published? Because uh, it's a mainstream book. It was published by, you know, Penguin Random House in the US and HarperCollins in Canada. And, uh, and you know, like, did you, how, was, how did your community take it? Because like, my, like Hannah Khan, it really delves into the weeds about um, identity and experience uh, growing up as a Muslim person. And the book, um, I, I and I, I was just so so shocked at how how much my own community has been hungering for these stories, and how much curiosity there is from the outside as well. Absolutely, yeah. No, I I, I love it. I just I wonder how many jobs can you have? Like how many jobs? <laughs> you are mothering teens. You are teaching <laughs> teens. Uh, well, what grade what grade are you teaching? You teaching high school? Uh, yeah, this semester is grade nine and grade ten. Yeah, you're teaching teens. You were writing books. Now you're like adapting to film. My goodness, <laughs> like, I thought yeah. I was busy. I'm a slacker. This is amazing. I have too many jobs, Tracy. Can I just tell you? Like, all I just work jobs. all the time. I mean, I'm and you do too. You, we just work all the time, right? Because all again, jobs. no safety net. If I fall, no one's gonna catch me. <laughs> Well, I always joke around at work. I've got too many people relying on this paycheck. I cannot leave. It's too many people. Um, are you reading anything with all your jobs? Like, is there anything on your summer reading list that you want to jump into or that you're reading right now that you want to tell us about? Yeah, you know, I just finished reading and this is, this is, this was such a fun read. Um, it's actually, uh, 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 so, so the novel's called New Girl in Little Cove. Uh, Little Cove, I, I don't know how to pronounce that, and it's by, by Downith um, Monaghan, and she's she's a an, a, a Canadian expat who lives in Britain, and it's it's a totally different take than Aisha at last. It's it's a story set in 1980s Newfoundland, and it's a young teacher who comes and basically you know talk. Uh, talks about her first year experience. It was just so refreshing and fun, kind of like for fans from Come From Away. Um, mm -hmm. That was really great. Uh, it was great. Uh, my friend um, SK Ali just released her uh, her follow up to her first YA novel, Saints and Misfits. So this is called Misfit in Love. And it's like South Asian wedding season, but then there's drama and there's like a lot of like identity, uh, questions about identity and love. There's like a love square. She's got three guys chasing her. And she's a young Muslim woman. I just loved it. It was so much fun. Uh, and um, let me think, what else? Um, Sonia Lali uh, also writes really fun uh, South Asian rom-coms. And her her next one is called um, uh, Holly Jolly Diwali, which is the best title ever. And I think that's coming out uh, in the fall so that you can look for that in the fall. 
Yes, uh, and I will I, be getting that. Sonia's been yeah. on our book list as well. She's amazing. She's great. Um, She's great. I love what she adds to the game. And listen, I was not grossed out by the biryani poutine. <laughs> I there's something about that combination <laughs> that is so good to me because I love poutine. I love biryani like together. And I like 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 mushy, like I like like mushy food. Yep. So oh, yep. oh, oh, I thought that was amazing. And I love that you have the uh, the recipe uh, for that in the book. Yeah, on my Instagram. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> Thank you. Yes, that's excellent. I didn't like it. I, I thought it was Don't weird, like it. but um, other my, my friends said they tried it and they, they're like, no, poutine and biryani actually really go well together. I beg to differ, but Hannah loves it for some <laughs> reason. It's Hannah's favorite dish. So like, you know, uh, yeah. characters have a life of their own. They're allowed to have their own opinions. <laughs> totally. Well, her mother thinks it's disgusting too, but <laughs> yeah. the love says she makes it for her anyway. <laughs> That's right. Listen, thank you so much, Ozma. It's so good to chat with you here. I know I'm going to see you back here again. Maybe we'll talk again when your film is on the big screen. Um, but I wish you so much luck and you're having so much success and prosperity and you deserve you. that because you are, you know, a Canadian treasure. You're adding stories uh, that we need to all be reading and jumping into, especially at a time like now. So thank you so much. Thank you for having me on, Tracy. Uh, this was wonderful. And please invite me back. I would love to chat some more about anything, books, whatever. <laughs> oh, yeah. We're going to book you for something. Could be parenting, <laughs> could be whatever. Maybe it's fashion. <laughs> I don't know. We're going to have you back on now because we love you. Um, so, you so for much. everyone uh, watching this, we are, um, we've got like a summer reading list that we are putting together. So you will see that on City Line. Uh, and yeah, get reading. It's the best way to have some adventure when we're all in lockdown for sure. Lizma, have a good day. To all of our viewers watching, thank you so much for hanging out with us and we'll see you next time for City Lines Book Club Live.